You're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. Here's something you may not have known about me. I was reared on stand-up comedians. That's right. Growing up, I was exposed to the greats, probably too soon for my age. Uh, People like George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Robin Williams, Eddie Murphy, and Chris Rock. They were all part of my repertoire. And my near-religious weeknight ritual with my father was watching The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and then being permitted to watch The Chappelle Show, even though the subject matter was arguably a bit inappropriate for a young teen. And then I moved to Paris, and I all but lost that connection, that bonding power of comedy. The most beloved French comics just really didn't hit the same way for me. It wasn't until years later when an English comic named Paul Taylor came up for his What the Fuck France series, sorry about the language, And that's when I started to seek out more of that world. And fortunately, there's now a robust English language comedy scene in Paris that feels like it's on the cusp of international recognition. And today's guest is one of the leading voices of that movement, the very, very funny American comic, Sarah Donnelly. Good morning, Sarah. Hi, Lindsay. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Oh, with pleasure. This is this is so exciting because A, I love comedy. B, we have mutual friends and it's yes. been, you know, basically like years in the making for us to talk. I know. Um, and three, I just saw, was this A, B or one, two, three? I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I just saw your show last week and have been laughing in my head ever since. So Thank this is you. very exciting. Very yes. Exciting. I, I'm very happy to be here. And I was mentioning before, there is Trevo, there is work happening in my building. They're drilling into concrete. It's a hobby of all Parisians to drill into concrete incessantly. Yeah. So I hope. I figure if there isn't background noise of some sort, then we're not doing it right. <laughs> right. We're not yeah, showing so the real Paris. So that's right. Would you, would you do a good job of, uh, of exploring? But before <laughs> we get to that, um, I have to say it's been a long time since I laughed that hard in an environment with other people because, you know. Oh. No, truly, because the the last stand-up I went to was Dave Chappelle in February 2020 in Paris. February 2020. Oh, my gosh. That's right. Was I – no, I didn't see him on that show. Well, he came back recently. Yeah, but I saw him one of the other times he performed. It was also February, but I guess it was February 2019. Yeah, he's got a thing for February. Um, Unfortunately, he made a lot of jokes that we now know to be um, uh, sort of signs of what was coming because he was joking about how people were coughing and like – no one get anybody sick. And it's like, oh, this didn't age well. Um, yeah. But, but you know, I mean, whatever. None of us knew. But all that to say, it's been a long time <laughs> that I was in a room with other people laughing with someone on stage. So does that get old for you? Never. Like being in that environment? No. Well, first of all, it was, uh, as we say in French, c'est avec plaisir, un grand plaisir. That's great to hear. It's great to hear a co- when you tell a comedian, like, I laugh so hard. You're like, tell me more. Tell me more how funny you thought I was. Um, no, that never gets old. I, I love, I'm going to see Mike Birbiglia tonight. So I love being in an audience, watching comedy, and I love being on stage. I mean, being on stage is the best. Making an audience laugh, a live audience laugh is why I think comedians do comedy. And yeah, it was during the pandemic. It was really hard. We were like all fiending for our endorphin kick and our dopamine kick. We're like, where, where's the audiences? And um, right after the theaters opened here, they were closed and they opened a little bit in the fall and they reclosed. And so in May of last year, when they really reopened, uh, that was great. Audiences were so ready to laugh. Everyone was just really having a nice time. It was such a good ambiance like everyone was just so happy so it was really really nice so yeah so so the pandemic obviously like thwarted all of all of your normal activities but you yes. were quite busy you were on tiktok doing some things and you know what was i mean was that sort of like a platform you discovered during this moment of having to be home and thought this is like a good comedic platform i I have been hearing whispers of TikTok. And I think I pushed TikTok away for a long time because I was like, that's for Gen Z. I'm too old to be on TikTok. So I was a late adopter of TikTok. 
um, the people who really started doing TikTok like during March 2020, those people have blown up. Like they were smart. Um, I kind of didn't get more into it until last spring. But actually during the pandemic, I wrote a series for Audible France called God Save My English. So with I with Paul Taylor, with Paul right? Taylor. Yeah. So Paul and I created a series. So I actually was very lucky as I was working the entire time. Um, so I was busy. So maybe that's why I was a late tick TikToker. I got really into TikTok last spring. I was having a lot of fun with it, but um I'm kind of soured on TikTok now. I've been turned well, off. it's it's a, it's exhausting, but you did have enough viral content to leave a lasting impression because, you know, one of the, the most recent things I think that when, you know, blew up that I heard people talking about outside your show when we were waiting to go in last week. Yeah. People were talking about your Picard bit. Oh, which my was, gosh. For, for those who don't know who are listening, Picard is a frozen food chain supermarket, um, which is actually quite brilliant. Um, but they do this very bizarre thing annually. What is it that they do? <laughs> Okay, so every year, Picar, Picar, um, <laughs> they do something called Crazy America, and they have American foods. And in years past, they actually would import in some American foods. Like one year, they had crab cakes. I was very excited about that. So I think <laughs> expats in Paris are, or in France in general, we get excited about Crazy America. We want to check out the food. But as the years go by, they've just decided to like – Crazy America is just their way of like slapping together any American foods and making a new food, which I criticize. I just mildly criticized Picard in this video. And literally, I did not realize Picard is actually UNESCO World Heritage Site. Like you, <laughs> it's protected by French law. If you criticize Picard, you will have hundreds of thousands of angry French people come to your page. They were so mad. All I said, I was like, this isn't really... American food and people were just no, it was like a bastardized it was a bastardization of of I, I don't know it, it was a it was a wonky interpretation I mean who's eating what, what, what was the weird thing pastrami like a, waffle the pastrami waffle that is not a thing it's not a it's thing it's not a thing this is what sent me over the edge I was like waffles good chicken and waffles good pastrami sandwiches great pastrami waffle no no one does that but so you so you really got hit with like a barrage of angry nonstop, users. nonstop. And it still continues to this day because the video is still, it's still getting views. You know, once it's out on TikTok, it just, it doesn't stop. It just keeps going. And so people still, I get daily criticisms of how my video <laughs> is wrong. <laughs> just well, like, what, what could they possibly say is wrong though? Well, the biggest critique, because in the beginning of the video, I was like, the French interpretation of American cuisine is just taking two things and smashing them together. And people are just right. like, uh, Americans don't have cuisine. <laughs> Which I'm going oh, to... That, that line. Oh, yes, of course. So that sets them off. But I'm like, I mean, yeah, we don't have cuisine. Have you seen what we look like? Do you know what we eat? This doesn't hurt us. That's not an insult to us. That you're not You're not hurting my feelings, okay? <laughs> By saying we don't have cuisine, they're like sick burn. I'm like, we're not hurt. Our feelings aren't hurt. No, um, <laughs> it's. But I, you know what? I I had to own my my mistake because I bought the pastrami waffle and it was it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. Oh, no, I, I got the veggie. Bur There's a veggie burger with a green bun. That thing was actually delicious. I bought like more of those. Um, Basically, everything I got from the collection, I made some follow-up videos. And I was like, this is really good. I'm so sorry I ever doubted Picard. <laughs> but still. And they're not watching those, are they? Well, no, they're not. The angry French mob. I mean, French people love to get into an angry mob. And, and you know, God, I my head would have been chopped off if this was 200 years ago, for sure. So <laughs> I'm glad I survived. <laughs> um, well, you know, this is, I mean, they, they love funfetti cake. They love basically even if it's not as bad as the the particular uh, week you were describing, I mean, it is pretty much like, here's America. It yeah. is all junk. Yeah. <laughs> You'd think we have no, you know, no good restaurants that people want to go to. But I anyway, know. That's, but that's why you're it's, here. It's, it's, <laughs> great. I'm trying to show people that we have a redeeming quality. You, you've got to show, um, yeah. But I'm here to make, to make fun of it, so. No, I mean, yeah, the thing is, America... America is a huge country and it's a land of extremes 
and you're going to find literally everything. So you're going to have some of the best food you've ever had and definitely some of the worst. That's for sure. Sure. Um, it's like the, the ghastly and the gorgeous. I mean, truly, this country does it all, right? <laughs> does it all. I, I was with my husband in South Carolina and we were in like a family dollar to try to get some groceries. And um, he saw the jar of the peanut butter and the jelly in the same jar, which first of all, French people, French, <laughs> they hate peanut butter and jelly. They think it's peanut butter to them is disgusting, even though they love peanut flavored cheese like a cheese puff thing called a curly it's like a cheese puff but peanut flavored they love that but god forbid you eat peanut butter so to see peanut butter and jelly in the same jar my husband was like what is this do people eat this he was like something <laughs> struck him to his core he was he was melting down he couldn't handle it so but you know what i think it just goes back to convenience culture right because for americans it's like well i don't have to then do as much because it's all in one jar. Right. Like I, I mean, that's embarrassing in its own, right? <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, I know you were just in the States recently and I was too, but I hadn't been back in three years. And so I opened my sister's refrigerator and I saw something so shocking. I can't wait it to was, hear this. I mean, you tell me if you've seen it because this was a first for me. It was in a sealable bag, hard boiled, pre hard boiled eggs that were also pre uh, unshelled. Yeah. And I look at my sister and I was like, what the hell is this? And she goes, well, you know, it's so annoying to have to remove the shell. And I was like, does it really take up that much of your time? What is this? You're like, of course I had to try it. How was it? Was it? Disgusting. Yeah. It doesn't look know, good. I have seen those. No. It's like, babe, we're not hunter gathering. Okay. It's okay. You can take the <laughs> shell. You can take the shell off the egg. Like we have washing machines now. Okay. It's going to be okay. No, those things I have, I have seen those and I think they're kind of a newish thing. Those look disgusting. I mean, listen, America is the king of convenience and, and France could take a few notes from that book, but yeah, that if I, I if know, I, do you need, <laughs> do you need a CVS or, or like a pharmacy open? Like you need an, an emergency pharmacy, but like, do you need to buy, I don't know, M&Ms at, 12 at night. I don't know. I guess maybe you do, but we've just grown so used to having all of these things immediately. Yeah. And sometimes I think that like, that's part of why America is so screwed up. Agreed. Agreed. And I, now as I, when I go back and I see that, I'm like, you know, the, the French person side of me is like, oh my gosh, the store's going to close soon. We have to go, you know, cause it's like seven o'clock and it's like, oh no, no. Target's open for like four more hours. Like you've got <laughs> tons of shopping time. <laughs> but then you see like, but then there's people that have to be there and work till 10 and 11 or o'clock at night or midnight or, you know, running the drive through at McDonald's until 2 a.m. or whatever. And then you're like, hold on, this, this, this isn't right. Like it comes at a cost, a human cost, which I do definitely appreciate France. I mean, the biggest thing, one of the biggest adjustment adjustments I had moving here was having everything closed on Sundays. And, and now there are some things there's more and more things that are open on Sundays, a little bit. But um, that was really hard for me because I was like, how am I supposed to get everything done in six days and blah, 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 blah. But then you kind of adjust and you're like, actually, this is nice that there is a day where people are going to have a day off. Imagine a day yeah. off work. Imagine that. Imagine that. I mean, it's true that it's sort of like, um, it's an adjustment. But like once you figure it out, you're sort of like, I'm going to be okay. Now, maybe yeah. if you live outside of a city, it's a greater inconvenience for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I think we, we have this, uh, this, this skewed idea of what should be available to us yeah. when you live in the States, you know, at all times. And, you know, I think the French have something like balance. Yeah. I don't know, a word Americans don't really know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now I have been so stuck in the countryside. Sorry. I have been stuck in the countryside when everything has been closed, trying to eat lunch at like three o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. Don't do that. You won't eat lunch. <laughs> yeah, no, you won't. You need to have you you need to have snacks. You need to be prepared. No, it's it definitely takes, as the French like to say, une organisation. You yes. need to be you know, you need to have forethought, which is, you know, sometimes you're just not in that place. Sometimes you're not um, in that place. No. So I got to ask you, because I don't know much about your 
story before seeing you on stage. So how did you how did you get to this point? Like you showed the photo of you arriving 10 years ago. But like, what was the story just before that? Like, why did you come and were you already into stand up when you were still in the States? I was into stand up in the States. I was living in Washington, D.C. I lived in Washington, D.C. seven years before I moved to Paris. And I was doing stand up and improv at Washington Improv Theater. But I still I had a I had a serious job. I like to say I retired at the age of twenty nine, and um, I long story short I came to Paris because I had a friend here. My sister was here for the summer, and I was like, I'm going to go to Paris. I have a free place to stay. This is great. And I met my husband, and we started having this long distance relationship. Paris, DC, and I really did not like my corporate job. So I was like, why don't I just quit and move to Paris? I want to be with this man. And that sounds pretty good. I mean, he doesn't live in like bumfuck Idaho. No offense to anyone in Idaho. But, you know, it's not a bad thing to move to Paris. Like there's, you know, there's worse places to move. So and um, I came to Paris and I literally started completely over from scratch. I mean, I did not know anyone. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know French really. I mean, I had taken like baby beginner French in the U.S. So, you know, I could kind of read a menu, make kind of. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day as it, like the 10-year anniversary approaches. I was like, wow, I didn't know anyone. I had no job. I had no money. I was just like at ground zero. But you're doing, you did it. Yeah. <laughs> even but even before Instagram and TikTok and Emily in Paris and, and all these Ugh. resources that are... <laughs> quote unquote resources that exist. Wait, I was just going to say, are you calling Emily in Paris a resource? Please no, do tell me more. No, I am not. But I think what Emily in Paris is doing is making Paris, it's making Paris feel accessible when it's not. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, I mean, Paris has always been a destination for Americans to move to, which is kind of the tongue, tongue in cheek part of my show. It's called The Only American in Paris because I think Americans, when they arrive, as I mentioned in the show, they have this idea that they're the only one and you are between your friends and family, you are the only one. So you are really unique. But it's like, no, people have been doing this for a very long time. It's always been a very sought after destination. I mean, look at the lost generation authors. And, you know, we can, I went to um, a chateau, uh, Chateau Villandry recently in the Loire Valley. And I was laughing because it was a Spanish doctor and his American kind of heiress wife that were like, oh, we're going to buy this chateau and like do it up. And this is like, you know, the turn of the 20th century. I'm like, see, rich American bitches have been coming here for years trying to, you know, turn chateaus, redo chateaus. And this is before, oh, what are those shows, those travel shows where people buy apartments, House Hunters International. I mean, this has been going on for a long time, so... No, you're absolutely right. And actually, I thought I thought that was a, a very clever framing to your show, which, you know, you go through some of the, you know, the obstacles that we all go through. I mean, I just yesterday uh, cited you because I was giving a talk to um, to these women travelers and we were talking about stereotypes and how that pertains to women, but also, uh, you know, mentioning sort of general stereotypes that actually do uh live up to the myth, which is, you know, basically being told in a store by even a clerk that like, they can't understand what you're saying because you messed up the gender of, you know, croissant. Um, and one of the travelers yeah. was like, oh, but it's not even just that. It's that they feel the need to correct you. You know, you clearly are not a French speaker. You're clearly a tourist. Like, did they really need to go through that effort to correct the way you say bonjour? Like they understood. But it's, but you know, and then we were sort of trying to understand, like, unpack where this comes from, like a childhood trauma and school days. and Learning but French go, but, is a childhood yeah. trauma for French people. <laughs> they are traumatized by their own language and they have to inflict that pain on everyone else because it's, it's really hard language. And even for French people. But, you know, the Italians have gender and <laughs> with their, with their words and, you know, and they're, they're lovely about you know, people learning Italian, probably because it's not as used perhaps to the same degree that, that French is in the world. Maybe Italians seem more relaxed. They have more sun and heat in their country. Um, my friend Sebastian Marx has a joke that the reason why French people, uh, Parisians specifically, are grumpy because it's Latin blooded people stuck in cold weather, um, <laughs> which I think is brilliant and true. So... <laughs> 
I think, you know, they're just trying to make it happen. But they complain when it's hot. There's really like just a very small window of temperature. No, no, no. It's like, it's like, oh, that's nice. 20... Yeah, it's like 25 degrees Celsius. Any hotter, you're going to hear a a chorus of complaints. But, yes. But it's true that this, the, the complaining really is something that's quite true. And, you know, they're perpetually dissatisfied with their lot in life, even if it's, you know, arguably in some cases, very privileged. Um, I'm wondering who, because you've mentioned now you've worked with Paul Taylor, who's a British yeah. comedian here, who similarly, you know, has in his early work has, you know, sort of talked about what that's like, particularly comparing British culture to French culture, which we know has a long heated history. Yes. Um, you just cited, uh, cited Sebastian, who's another Anglo comedian. Who were, who were your influences, though, you know, growing up? And then who in France do you think is, you know, doing interesting stand-up work? Oh, my gosh. Well, I, I have so many. Um, I, always, I always have loved stand-up comedy. I remember as a teenager, like, watching Comedy Central Premium Blend on Friday nights. Like, just, you know, growing up in North Carolina, there was – I think there was maybe, like, one comedy club in the entire state. Um so it wasn't anything I ever could ever I ever thought I could do, but I've always been a big fan. And I think I saw this special called The Comedians of Comedy, which had Patton Oswald, Maria Bamford, Brian Posen, and Zach Galifianakis. And that like blew my mind. I was like, oh my gosh. They're doing such interesting things. So I've always loved Maria Bamford. Um Kathy Griffin was another like early influence because she talked about pop culture and I saw her do like two hours in DC in like 2008 and I thought that was so impressive. She's went up sta on stage and she was very authentically herself. Um, I was thinking like other things that I've seen. I mean, I love comedians. I love comedy. So I follow all sorts of people. I love having a diversity of like styles and voices. Um, I don't know if you've seen Inside from Bo Burnham, but that's one of the best things I think I've ever seen. Yes, yes, he's uh, he's spectacular. God, he's like a, a genius. Love that. I just saw um, Bill Burr, Friends Who Kill. Netflix had a comedy festival in May, and they filmed several of the specials. And I just watched that like four days ago, and I was like, wow, like I forgot how much I really like Bill Burr. Um, he's such a killer, and he's so true to his voice, and he doesn't allow himself to get boxed in. And he has some jokes about um, – What's his name? Kyle Rittenhouse. So uh, he really goes there. And the Michelle Wolf equally uh, really, oh, yeah. really goes there about white women and um, kind of white fragility and white women. So they're like, they're totally great. So anyways, I love all sorts of comedians and I love seeing what people are producing and putting out there. Um, in terms of the French stand up, you had previously mentioned, like you saw Shirley Soignon. Shirley is great. Um, I love Shirley, but I, I honestly think that maybe why I like her is because her style approximates the American style of stand-up, yeah. um, which is to say, you know, it's not necessarily all about physical comedy. She, her delivery is more American, I would say, or maybe more like, like a Dave Chappelle or a Chris Rock. Yeah, or, she's got jokes. Or, she's... Yeah, jokes, but also like she is so good at improvising according to the audience response. Um, and in a way that is not just sort of like I'm a, I'm a solo performer up here and I'm just going to keep going like Blanche Gardin. I, I'm not really into her stuff. Uh, and I think it's almost like she's just this performer and doesn't. I don't know. It's like there's not the same level of engagement with the audience. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I do. Um because I think Blanche does have a more of like a one, as they say in France, the one woman show feel, the one man show feel. Um, I, I think Shirley's great. Um, she just consulted on the show Droll or Standing Up. Oh, she did. She did. Yeah. Okay. She wrote a lot of the jokes in that show. She was a consultant on that show. Um, I really enjoyed that show because I thought it, did a great job of peeking into the stand-up world and I thought it was very well executed and they had I don't know if you saw it um I did but they had several real French stand-ups who are actually doing stand-up do stand-up in the show so the main cast are all actors but when they had they showed a couple clips of different people on stage one guy named Jason Brokers who also was um, a writer for the show who's a stand-up um, Hakeem Jimele and a few others. So 
I thought that show was really cool. So if you're interested in kind of seeing stand up in a very dramatized way, you can watch that. I quite liked it. It's canceled. No more. There's going to be no season two. I know. And which, by the way, I mean, it did very well and Netflix still decided to cancel it. But we all know Netflix is going through some uh, growing pains, some streaming war uh, tension. But anyway, it did very well, was very well received. And it's still out there. So definitely, you know, everyone should watch watch that season. It's good. But but do you think do you think there's something to be said for physical comedy? Um, And I I mean, I know the French love Jerry Lewis. (laughs) And if you think about the films, even so not stand up, but films that have done comedic films that have done very well, the, the, the director or the comedic sort of force who never really found an audience here was Judd Apatow and his films. It was almost like the material was so American that the friend, I mean, honestly, every single person I spoke to was like, yeah, it's not funny. And I did a whole thing in college. I did an audience audience analysis about like, what is it about? his work that the that falls flat in France and it had to do with you know like the types of comedy that mm. French people find funny and also the subject matter and it's you know probably because Americans are so prudish that they like need to let it all out in the theater um and the French are just like why do you think it's funny about having sex like hmm? that's so interesting I would love to hear more about that um I would really love to hear your analysis I think it this goes to show how like they don't America exports America doesn't really export comedies and you see very few like <clears throat> mainstream comedies being exported to France like I can think of The Hangover I can think of um like movies I saw posters for in the in the metro like Hangover 2 and I saw um Amy Schumer's film which I can only remember the French title which was Crazy Amy cuz they just called oh, right. crazy <laughs> Crazy Amy <laughs> Because they're like, there's a titled English. Let's just translate it to another English title that makes less sense. Um, Baffling. So it's hard for me because I feel very out of touch of like, what are the comedies? They just, they don't come But like, they like Jim Carrey. You know, if you think, and not that he's doing much now, but before, like Liar Liar, all of those films did well. And I wonder if it's because there's this very physical quality to Jim Carrey that you know, the performative element that goes beyond, that was a different genre of comedy. Yeah, I do think historically France has liked that more physical style because I think the world was much bigger 20 years ago, you know? Like, the world is so small these days, especially, like, post-COVID. I feel like the opportunities are now endless for comedians to make content and share content and this idea... Whereas before, maybe it would be like, no, we, you know, you live in France. You, you can't have a, you can't have a show on Netflix or you can't talk about this or that. I, I feel like that's changing. Um, even though comedy is very cultural, there are comedians who do touch, you know, people globally. And I think we've seen in the past couple of years, like you mentioned, Dave Chappelle is coming to Paris. He's come to Paris several times. Louis C.K. has come to Paris several times. Um Mike Birbiglia, Mark, Mike Birbiglia is coming tonight, I think, for the first time. So more and more comedian, Chris Rock was just here. More and more comedians are coming because they realize their audience really does extend, like there's a wider net. Um, I'm always curious to see who comes to these shows as well. If they're all expats, if they're all, if it's international. I, I mean, I can tell you just at Dave Chappelle when I went, granted different times, but it was a really good mix. So yeah. I ran into several other Anglos who I didn't know were going to be there. But then I was seated next to a bunch of Frenchies who were losing their minds. I mean, you know, so clearly you have to have a certain level of English to engage with this kind of a show. And I think that's changing too. I think the overall English level is improving. Like young French people, they're on Netflix and they want to watch all this stuff. And they're watching it probably in English with French subtitles or even English subtitles. So I think that's also pushing kind of more American style comedies coming into France. Um, so yeah, I don't know where we started with that question, but that's where I'm ending. No, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad we, we ended up where we ended up. And so I'm thinking back to last week and the, sh- and, and, you know, so this was your only American in Paris show. Um, is that coming to an end then th- later this month? Well, or I just temporarily, I have a final show the end of this month, but the show 
I am self-produced. Um, I'm, I do it all myself. I don't have a production company or a tour manager or anything like that. So I would like to keep the show going. Um, so I'm, I'm hopefully going to have some more dates in the future and I'm going to hopefully, I'm trying to put together a little tour to go to some dates in, in France in the fall. So if, if people are so interested. So when you traveled before, because mm -hmm. I've seen you, you're saying, oh, I'm going to Lille, I'm going to perform here. So all of that is your own doing that you, you, you hook those, those things up, those dates. Uh, it depends. Um, I, for example, I went on tour with Gad Elmale as his opener. Um, and that's someone I wanted to mention is like having, trying to get a more global audience. He did a world tour. He sold out like almost every show. I mean, he's hugely famous in the Francophone world, but this was all of, this was his English tour. Um, and he performed in English. He did over an hour in English. He had a show on Netflix in English. So he was someone I was thinking like, he's really trying to crack that kind of global, you know, comedy is kind of for everyone. Even if I'm French, I'm talking about cultural differences. Um, so I've been, I've been to a lot of places. Sometimes it's doing openings. Sometimes it's comedy festivals. Sometimes it's me. It really just depends. But, um, you know, I'm a comedian. I'll take any job. <laughs> That's, yeah. I mean, I was going to say you're a hustler. Also. I'm a hustler. I mean, comedians have to be, they have to hustle. Um, yeah. I have two, two other questions. You, in the show last week, um, I think the part where I really lost it was... <laughs> And I'm, I don't want to give anything away, but there's a moment where you address something that I, I feel like, uh, f first of all, it was, it was like, it's like you had, had been a, a fly in my WhatsApp group with a few women who during COVID <laughs> would comment on Edouard Philippe, the, you know, the then prime minister, because one of the women in my group, in this chat group was like, found him to be just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and then other people talking about... Macron and is he cute is he just insufferable because he's like you know a narcissist um but you you sort of said who cares what your political alignment is I think they're all hot and let's you know let's let's go into this and I wondered as I was cackling inappropriately I thought to myself for the French people in the audience who are like vehemently opposed to Macron's administration like can they still find that funny Yes, because I have a friend who at the show, at the show you were at sitting on the front row, it's kind of talking to me a little bit. Um, she is very much anti-Macron, but she loved that part of the show. She thought it was great. So I think uh, we can all have a little fun objectifying men in power. I, that's, I mean, that's what that's about. It's about flipping, reversing the roles and like, let's just whittle you down to a piece of meat. <laughs> You did a great job of that. <laughs> Excellent work. Um, no, but and it, and it's true. That's the part in the show where I feel like it just it just you know it hit a crescendo. Um, and then of course you have other moments where it comes back up. Uh, and 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 truly, I think it's so well balanced in that way. But I was just curious if there was anything. Maybe it's not that, but is there anything that you find? Um, in terms of your your jokes or certain bits that the French have more difficulty uh, accepting? Well, I've been, I've been in France for a while and I've been doing stand-up the whole time. And I think now, I think my audience is really French. I think I do really well in front of a French audience that speaks English, God willing, and um, people that have lived in France for a while. So I find, I have found with visiting comedians, if you go to blue, which is a bit um, like rude, you know, if you're being really explicit with like your sexual jokes, the audiences kind of bristle at that. Like that can't just be the punchline. There's got to be something a little more there. If that makes any sense. Like mm -hmm. they're not going to laugh at sex for sex, you know, pee pee caca, you know, <laughs> penis vagina jokes. Um, if that's the punchline, there's got to be, you got to be saying something a little bit deeper than that. Otherwise they're like, okay, this is cheap. And I think that's fair. There's audiences in America that would be like that too. But, um, I have seen in the past comics come from New York and you know, it's quite hard and raw and it can be very much in your face. And that confrontational style I've seen French audiences not be as into, but that was a couple years ago. Mm. And I think things are really changing. So. 
I often wonder how someone like Robin Williams, if he were still alive, if he were to do shows again, like what, what that would have been like here today, because I do, I think to your point, we're seeing so many comedians come through Paris, the way concerts, you know, musicians come through Paris, you know, and I, I found it almost surprising. I was like, Dave Chappelle's here. Oh my God. I got to see him. If, if he's coming to this town, you know? Yeah. Um, and I wonder how some of those old, uh, oh God, who's, what is, why am I blocking on? Is that Richard Pryor? You know, like some of these old school comedians, were they to be alive? Like, would they have a home here? And I guess this is just an open-ended rhetorical question, but. I mean, we're seeing, you know, huge, big name celebrity comics in the U.S. Like, you know, Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle and Louis C.K., um, come to Paris and, and find that, you know, they can fill a room and they do have an audience here. And so I think, you know, that's spreading the word for other comedians, you know, kind of the next tier down. And I think, um, I think people are willing to try it. Like I was in LA a long time ago, um, when I first moved to Paris and I was just visiting and, and taking improv class at UCB theater in LA anyways. And, uh, I had some friends that I knew from my stand-up days in DC and they're like, you live in Paris and you get to do stand-up? That sounds so amazing. I'm like, yeah, but you live in LA. Like you're at the industry and that like, they almost didn't hear that. So I think Paris, there's something about saying Paris gets people excited and it's a great like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I could do a show in Paris. That's awesome. Yeah, I want to go to Paris. I just opened for Todd Berry recently um, and I think he definitely was of that like, yeah, I want to come to Paris. And and he had I mean, that's audience. exciting. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's exciting that they're coming and that they're seeking that out. Now, I happen to live in a neighborhood where one of the sort of standout uh, comedy clubs uh, has its headquarters, which is Panam. And you're doing Tuesday night. It's like English night, right? Yes, we're trying to get it off the ground. Um, historically, in 2013, I actually started a show there with another guy named Robert Hain. Um every Tuesday night way to show in English. And so that kind of got killed in March, 2020. I was on the last show there before they shut down um, before the pandemic, the last English show there. So we're trying to revive it. It's almost every Tuesday night. We're still working on the schedule, but it will be on Tuesdays and just trying to make a home at the Panem because the Panem is a place where we see where French comedy and real stand-up comedy, um, the American style stand-up comedy. It, it's a, uh, breeding ground for, mm-hmm. for a standup. And, um, it's so funny cause I was doing standup in French for a while. That was like a little goal of mine. And I did it for about nine months and my kind of home base was at the Panem. And it's really interesting. Like a lot of the people that I was doing shows with, um, you know, they're, they've since moved on, like they've kind of outgrown the Panem and now they're, you know, doing movies and they're, they've got their own shows and big venues and stuff. So it's really cool to see that happen. Um, but you had asked me earlier and I, I wanted to definitely make sure I mentioned these two comedians. Who do I like in French comedy? Um, Tanya Dutel is great. And I think she is so, so funny. Um, she is very dry. She's very raw. She has her own style. She's a very authentic voice. And I think her jokes are very blunt in that American way. And I, I love, I love her. I think she's hilarious. And there's another comedian named Marina Cars who historically has done stand up, but in the pandemic, she started doing these videos. She has characters and, um, they're great. And I love them so much. And I saw her show a couple months ago in March. I saw her show in Paris. It's called Nanette. And, You've got to see her. She's so good. And Tanya has a show going right now um, in Paris too. So they're both excellent female French comedians who really have a great Love authentic it. voice. Two thumbs up. And 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 in, just to, to name drop a couple of other theaters where people can see performances, uh, Shirley co-founded or founded the Barbas Comedy Club, yes. right? Yep. So Which is a, another home. It's another home for stand-up. Shirley, that's her club. There's a show every Sunday night. Um called the New York Comedy Night, which Sebastian Mark has hosted in Paris for many, many years. That's its home. There's on Saturday nights, Goku Comedy, Goku Comedy Club on Saturday nights at six o'clock. There's a show called the Great British American Comedy Night. My friend Hugo Gertner hosts that. Um, And those are kind of the two main 
shows, but there is actually tons of shows happening in English in Paris. So there's a website, English Comedy in Paris dot com, and there's an Instagram, Excellent. and you can find all sorts of stuff happening in English. Um, and people can still find your Audible show that you co-wrote, right? I mean, it's still on. That's on Audible. It's called God Save My English. It's to help French people learn English through comedy. Um, but I think it's quite funny. <laughs> so I think actually English speakers might enjoy it as well because we, because of our conversation. And then of course you can find me on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and all those things. I know I'm waiting for your next viral thing on TikTok, but now I kind of understand maybe why you soured on TikTok if all the trolls came out of the woodwork. I mean, it's kind of like a, mm. that wasn't even why I soured on TikTok. I think I had someone steal a joke um, from my show and make it into a TikTok. And that really turned me off because Ooh. TikTok is TikTok a la base is about copying. It's like video memes. And so people see something and they do the same thing, whether it's a dance, you know, everyone does the same TikTok dance or the same kind of audio, you know, everyone uses the same audio, which there's this very blurred line. I think people don't understand that. Okay. But I'm, a writer, this is my show and you've taken my words and, and you saying them and you're not, you know, saying that it's from me or inspired by me. You're just saying them as if you're, they were your own and that's just full on plagiarism. <laughs> so that kind of turned me off. Got to be honest. Um, I can understand that. I think, I think we're, we're so used to coming out, uh, in support of people who, uh, share stories of this happening on Instagram. And maybe that hasn't quite come to TikTok yet, the sort of uh, collective outrage at at this kind of, you know, plagiarism. It's the Wild it West. It's uh, TikTok is the Wild West. It's, um, for example, Tanya, there was someone who made a fan account and they had taken clips of her stand up from Netflix and, um, you know, just online and was reposting them and getting like, hundreds of thousands of views and after a certain point like you make money off of that but she's like hey hello like this is my material you're making money off my back like this is my hard work you're just re-uploading a video it was a big big problem and really unfair because she doesn't and have the right to repost a netflix like netflix owns that you know so it and they could actually come after her if they were you know yeah. paying attention yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or doing their their due diligence. Yeah. Um, I have to ask before before we end because I feel like I have seven billion other questions. <laughs> it's just what what happens from here? Like, what in an ideal world would your shows look like? And and is there is there something you're striving for in this town? Is it your own sort of uh, supported show on on streaming? Is it you know performing in a different way, leading a festival? Like, what is it that you you hope comes next? That's such a good question. And I, every year I try to think of like, okay, what is my goal for this year comedy wise? So this past year was to get my own one hour up and I, I have, and I'm really proud. I'm really happy with the show. Um, I would love to keep this show going. I would love to write another hour, um, kind of get a bit deeper with the joke writing. And I am working on a, a comedy pilot so I would love to you know yeah get a get a show on streaming and show that just because you're based in Paris you know that there's a voice I can still have a voice that might be interesting globally or in the U.S. market because I'm going to write it in English I'm not writing French oh my god no 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 Ooh. I mean yeah that I, you'll, you'll cut through the noise by being uh, the, the <laughs> Anglo voice in Paris absolutely but you are very funny keep doing it I'm Thank you. I kind of wish I could go back and relive that that moment of the the Macron thirst trap uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna be thinking about it for a long time but you're, you're so good keep going and you know if people want to find you in town they can find you uh on Instagram, follow your shows. On your website, you list your shows as well, I'm assuming. Yes, I, I need to update that. But my handle is Sarah D Comedy, Sarah D Comedy .com. That's Sarah D Comedy is also my Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. I usually post most on my Instagram, all the shows, um, but I have I have a website and I'm always I'm always around. I'm taking this week so you off. Find her. But I'm always here doing shows. <laughs> and maybe you'll find her at Picard buying <laughs> pastrami waffles. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me.
That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. Until next time, I've been Kate. 